欢大家好。It's an honor to welcome you all here and to represent, of course, the nation of Taiwan to its finals. 在这个时期办理论坛，我想它的意义相当的深刻。大家有机会交换各种意见、各种见解、各种看法，乃至于各馆的执行方式。This conference will be will will give us a chance to share. Uh, opinions, ideas, and insights. 在我们国家里面，有老辈的人会讲一句话：“中越壮越响，坚如猛虎胆。” So this will this will give us a chance also to share our professional experience. 那论坛其实也兼具这样的一个性格，就是大家呢。能够把不同的见解提出来，互相辩证，越辩证越明朗，越辩证越丰富，越多元。And this will also create the basis for、uh, combining all our different experiences into、uh, a new, more complete view of architecture. 非常谢谢。那个参与论坛的专家、策展人，也谢谢各位的出席，欢迎各位，谢谢。So thanks again for taking part in this conference, and thanks again to all the people who were interviewed today. Thank you. 
that started to produce objects of um, representation and objects of understanding that are actually, in fact, the ones that are allowing architecture to push itself forward. With the construction of those documents, of those evidences, of that critique, of that history, um, what also occurs is that one can enter metadiscursive spaces in which that space of display doesn't contribute anymore to all the different uh, uh, players in the architectural uh, project. Um, I don't think there is a problem per se in the exhibition or in the architectural exhibition that only has, let's say, spaces of representation. I think the problem is what are those objects representing, right? So, um, and as much as sometimes we might think that architectural projects, we could argue that this one is an architectural project, we could argue that that one is a sculptural project. Some would be display and some would be architectural. And yet the, the question is what is the thought that emanates from them? I think that's a real question. What is the performative quality of the, of the object? I would say architectural thinking is very fast. Architectural building is very slow. And so the mediums of display uh, uh, sometimes produce architectural thoughts and sometimes they produce other types of thoughts. And so I don't think it's so much about medium specificity, it's about concept specificity. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are some, a lot of topics that... Th thanks very much for inviting us. But I mean, like, uh, the, the question that you open, I think that is... is um, Super open in itself, in a way like I mean, like discussing representation of these issues. I mean, it would be like a conference in itself. <laughs> I think, like, I'm just trying to think about like how to focus um, maybe uh, into more like a polemic kind of um, set the conversation. Like I mean, like what would be um, if it's about the medium? What will be the specificity of an exhibition on architecture versus other exhibitions, for example? No, I mean. I don't have an answer for that, but I mean, but I think that is, is a good, basically, is, I think it's a, is a good topic to think in itself, in a way, because uh, I think that that's a way of describing how architecture is understood. And in that sense, I think that uh, what normally was understood as kind of a national pavilion structure, which is maybe like obsolete from certain kind of political or kind of global point of view, at the end becomes very productive because frames the different kind of um, performativity that was said according to a specific context in a way. Like. So I mean, you cannot evaluate the exhibition as a kind of a global effect mm -hmm. only if you detach it from the specific kind of national specificity that has been uh, embedded. And then the, I think that that kind of like tension between the kind of the super global condition of the discipline versus the kind of the specific politics of each of the kind of the scenarios where the exhibition are displayed I mean, um, is, is uh, an ongoing discussion. I think that, that is not a very clear kind of status what, what is su supposed to be now, a Biennale, for example. I mean, I think that it's not what is, it was like 50 years ago or 25 years ago or 50 or five years ago uh, because the kind of the globalization is an impact that we cannot like uh, skip to discuss. But on the other hand, I mean, I mean, each kind of country tries to basically promote certain kind of specificity. So, I mean, this kind of like um, paradox between the kind of the global, super hyper globalized practice versus the kind of the still attempt to frame the discussion of the work within a specific kind of yeah. context. I think that is a very interesting kind of tension that I don't, know, I don't have a resolution for it, but I think that this will be for me one of the engines of thought about what is the Biennale today. You know? Let me ask you one thing, Luis, because um, you're <laughs> I mean, you're creating the Spanish, you're deputy creating the Spanish pavilion, right? Mm -hmm. Yet there's also a Catalan pavilion, yeah. right? And, um, <coughs> and this is one of the questions that no one wanted to talk. So we move from this play to maybe like uh, mm -hmm. one of the topics that, that really was being discussed here. Um, national pavilions, this, the fact that yes, it offers a framework for the discussion of particularities. It perpetuates um, an understanding of the world. Uh, almost, it tries to stabilize it, right, through the uh, acceptance of territories. When in fact, uh, 
political boundaries, they are not cultural boundaries, nor, um, nor geographical. I mean, if we were to see what are the, what are the real uh, drivers of the constitution of, um, of boundaries today, we could think of obviously trade, but also the species and ecologies and energies, right? And so for me, the question of uh, what constitutes a nation according to a particular moment in time is something that um, that should be more revised than uh, than than less, and ultimately the idea of culture, I mean, the, the birth of the nation state, right? That somehow uh, is the one that has produced the the current configuration of nations. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty recent thing, yes. right? Yes. So, and and if you ask me, um, in the sense in which the United States. Uh, has accepted a uh, foreigner to be the <laughs> creator when in fact they have the condition that only US citizens can be the creators of their pavilion yeah. um, is already a way of understanding that, that we are participants of larger cultural frameworks and that governments are not anymore to defend and to promote their own national identities but their participation in the construction of certain territories of culture. So and yeah. this becomes even more relevant yeah. being here. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Yeah, no, I think that, that um, you're right. I'm, I'm just saying that that suddenly becomes productive the fact of the request for definition of that boundary. In a way, no? I mean, that for me is the engine of, of the specific of the Venice Biennale versus other Biennales, for example, no? where you have other kind of more thematized kind of approaches and so on. But the fact that you need, for example, I mean, in the case of the Spanish pavilion, I mean, I mean, basically it's understood more like a Mediterranean kind of environmental kind of condition that is much more relevant in terms of the content than not the kind of the nationalities, for example. No? I think in that sense, but it's not one or the other. I mean, they complement each other, but I mean, basically, uh, the, the request for definition of what is the kind of the frame of discussion and what is the frame of the content, in the case of Venice, I mean, each kind of iteration becomes a kind of a political statement of some sort, in a way. And in that sense, I think it's becoming very productive. So it's obsolete as a kind of like, a, maybe, as a kind of a way of understanding the, the political structures, but on the other hand, super relevant because the world still works in that sense, but also like conceptually becomes very productive. Right. Fact of the right. um, now, as we talk about boundaries <coughs> and nations, I guess, you know, one, one of the ways that we can uh, ab abstract this train of thought is territories. Now, there are many forms of territories. There's con conceptual territories. In fact, we see PhDs go to battle all the time with each other over ideological territories, which is really super interesting to watch. Uh, and I think, you know, in some ways, what uh, what the both of you are bringing up, uh, although it seems that at a glance, uh, you, you, the two of you might be uh, not in agreement, but I, I actually see something here where, if we're talking about contextual specificity, or regional specificity versus conceptual specificity, uh, I'm obviously much, much more interested mm. in conceptual specificity and you know, the, the sure. inter intellectual targeting of sure. you know, uh, what makes the territories, and what are the strategies and sure. techniques of you know, the patterns of territories. Uh, I think that's a much more interesting topic sure. to get into. Sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> The very theme of the Biennale, right? What it tries to do is to, uh, in this denunciation of the flatness of the field, is to actually say that the territory of architecture has become one mm -hmm. flattened field where we cannot distinguish those conceptual territories, where to operate and to understand how to move forward, right? Because it's too large and too big. Um, of course, the question is. Uh, provocation, uh, the assumption is less than a reality, but it really forces um, everyone who's participating to try to articulate what are those fundamental territories, right, that uh, are able to bring us around a table and a conversation. So perhaps the, the question then, um, I think as well, bringing it back to you, right, humanity in which um, the fact of the representation of a country or a territory and the identification of what is essential to that. Mm -hmm. right? I remember one of the talks we did at the store from one of the first ones was um, um, 
Persian Latin territories or something mm. like that. Mm. What is that that is essential to a certain culture? Right? What is that that is essential to a particular territory? Not conceptual one, but cultural, social, mm -hmm. uh, the political body right, of people. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, sure. No, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just trying to. I, I agree with that. But I mean, I will instead of opening so much a thing up to the culture, which I think that is almost like I think that becoming like super architectural specificity will be more relevant as well. Like in terms so of it will be more relevant, relevant or irrelevant. Relevant. Relevant. You know, which is instead of saying okay, we have to open it to the social, the political, and the cultural. That's a by default thing because architecture all embeds all those kind of layers of <laughs> of, um, of unfolding. But on the other hand, what is highly specific from the discipline and the field in that discussion, I think that is, is for me one of the kind of the most challenging aspects instead of opening, basically just narrowing down to discuss what is highly specific from each of the pavilions in terms of statement about the discipline itself, no? which one could be about the openness of it, but, but it doesn't about have, what? about the open, the open condition of, of mm -hmm. the discipline, but it, it doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, but uh, I guess what, what I'm also thinking is that uh, what can be overcome by how? Uh, if we're saying the same things, but how we say it is you know, slightly uh, advocating or so. If we're talking about the, the culture at large, and if a, a certain culture begins to uh, you know, display symptoms of mutation, and but, accidentally say stuff differently, but how but, we say it. Uh, but then, then maybe we have to go back to the medium. Yeah. Like, in, like the how, I mean, I mean, what is the medium that each of the kind of the proposals are using in order to talk about the discipline? If it requests a kind of like, for example, accumulation of information <coughs> that is detached from one from each other, or highlights the relational condition of architecture, those are completely different kind of approaches in terms of the medium that it generates. If it's representing built kind of structures, or if it represents representation of built structures, is another statement in a way. So, I mean, the medium becomes super relevant in terms of its cultural implications, but also its understanding of the discipline. I mean, what is highlighting as the core and the fundamental request in terms of disciplinary discussion? Not only what it exists, but what it should be, in a way. I didn't know to have a question about disciplinarity. Probably for me, it's one of the most boring conversations. No, it's always. so dry that Mitch sure. left. So, um, um, I, do, I do think that um, I never understood what is the fear that we have of the vastness, right, of opening, of articulating many things at the same time. Um, and that's apparently, I think that conceptually it's a very part of the uh, modern culture, right? One, singularity is better than multiplicity. Focus is better than openness and ambiguity. And, and that, as such, I think uh, what it does is, is introduce uh, a space of uh, narrowness that architects, as, uh, as you were saying before, uh, in the core carry already all those different elements, mm -hmm. right? But to say that they already carry them, and therefore we don't have to talk about them in an, uh, in an extrinsic way, not an intrinsic way, mm -hmm. and then stops from really understanding mm -hmm. how those things affect, transform, right? So, um, and, and this is for me, um, Still, the real question, I, I, when we talk about the Barcelona Pavilion, yes. right, and I would like to make a, a kind of explanation about how I see that project. Okay. Because for me, I never read that project as a detail of a column or a diagram. For me, the building that we managed to produce, and probably I'm one of the most, the means of the rock pavilion, when uh, the king Alphonse Carl had to go and open that pavilion, right? He was used to be the center of his own universe, right? This energy. And one could argue that certain architectures were produced for those symmetries where someone would sit in the middle of it. <laughs> um, yet when he arrived into the print, what he found was a set of steps that were positioned tangentially to a square in which he had to climb, not centrally to his space, but tangentially. He arrives at the top and he finds a surface of water that is not the center. He moves to the right, right? He tries to find the center and he's not. He's between the roof and the openness of the water. When he's in that position, he tries to enter the pavilion. When he enters, definitely there is not a central space. He keeps on going and he arrives to the end that is not the center because it's already outside, right? And there's another body of water. He turns around and he tries to still find that center 
and the king suddenly surrounded with people around that opening. He is not anymore the king of any place, not that place. The plane, the horizontal element, makes everyone standing on that surface the king of their own freedom, right? So you, I always say that if the French managed to kill kings with a guillotine, Mies managed to do it with architecture. And that is my reading, right? Mies would never say, I am political. <laughs> this was a political project. I'm really trying to be political here, right? The guy just did what he did best. He understood, he always thought that he was able to produce architecture. The highest aspiration of an architect was to produce the architecture of its time. And that was a time of no kings, right? So, and I'm making this reading of the Barcelona Pavilion because only understanding the social and political context in which that pavilion emerged, in that it was an opening, it was a national opening, that that, for me, that building translates the aesthetic <laughs> beauty that made it reconstruct even after it disappeared, because there is a value in it that when we try to understand why architecture and composition formally something has a value, is because it's able to transform the histories that we carry, the politics that we carry, the cultures that we carry into something else. And that's, for me, the only way that we can assess the value of architecture. If we are to assess the value of architecture of me as according to something else, I think that we enter a mistaken game. This doesn't mean that we don't have to learn the language of architecture to understand how to move away from it, because that's the only way, the only instruments we have. But to make of that the ultimate content, that would be a mistake. That would be an, uh, an exhibition about underwear. That can be extremely interesting, but less relevant. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, am happy to provoke the, the kind of the reaction of the pseudo sociologist. I mean, like, I mean, basically, I think that getting bored about architecture is not an architectural problem. It's an architectural problem, like that somebody is getting, I mean, is doing a bad project somehow. I mean, the, the social implications of political architecture are evident. That's absolutely clear. And uh, I'm not just moralizing about what should be or not should be architecture. I'm just saying that basically finding the specificity, and it's not like a stable one, it's something that requires a constant redefinition of that. Through, for example, um, the things that architects do best, which is normally not sociology <coughs> or kind of other kind of theories, those are like theories, I think it's relevant as well, in a way. So the, the notion of relevance is not about like, one or the other is about basically, I mean, but that's a personal interest. Like, I'm interested basically in architectural matters somehow. And that has certain kind of level of, of um, conditions that uh, is not encapsulated. It's not about like closing anything. It's just about, like what is more relevant to discuss architecture today and how each of the countries or each of the scenarios or the project requires a specific medium. So that's why I think that the medium in itself becomes super important because, I mean, it's. <coughs> Very telling about how he's understanding the, the, the kind of the, the way of discussing the field. Can you give an example? Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah, for example, the Spanish pavilion is the only one that is showing 12 bit buildings. Oh, sorry, the, is, the mic went out. No, the, the, the Spanish pavilion is the only that shows 12 built buildings, for example. Okay. That's very different from other pavilions, which is not a. Yeah, 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 no, 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 like, like in the last two years, which is, it's not, I'm not competing. No, it's not but I don't understand the specificity of that. No, which means that basically it's, a, it's basically that it's theorizing through built construction, mm -hmm. which is, is one of the ways. I'm not saying that it's the only way, so don't get nervous. I'm not just saying it's one of the only ways. And I'm just saying that other countries <laughs> are doing other things. That's why I say that the medium that each country chooses, I mean, I think it's relevant in, in the way that understands or the kind of the field unfolds in each of the places, which is not monolithic. <laughs> and it's not as homogeneous as one of the maybe like kind of globalized claims are talking about. I mean, there are still distinctions that are relevant to the territories that has to do with ge specific geographies, specific economies, specific kind of environments, specific traditions, histories, um, markets, cultures, and so on, that basically when you go through the pavilions, I can still see certain kind of differentiation that I think is productive in that sense. I'm not saying... Mm -hmm. The main idea is to the two thoughts together uh, a little bit better. Well, I feel like you know, that, that was a really, <coughs> so whenever you were describing your reading of the Barcelona Pavilion, I thought that was a very, uh, a very beautiful interpretation of uh, the, the architectural effects of Barcelona Pavilion, mm -hmm. which is an architectural effect. Absolutely. Right? And so the, uh, let's say, democratization of uh, central power 
where you know the, the, the movement from autocratic states to uh, uh, the, yeah, the democratic plan. And so the plan has the has the ability to create that. So I, I wonder, you know, when, you said, when do, do you not see this as an architectural effect? Because uh, and so when you say solely on architecture, which you know, no, 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 uh, no, no, I'm just saying that that I'm I'm. Um, I'm interested in discussing the specificity of each of the mediums and its powers mm -hmm. and the differentiation between them. What I'm saying is like one of the things that uh, distinguishes architecture <coughs> versus other practices like writing or like, um, yeah, uh, like uh, social sciences mm -hmm. or art practices <coughs> um, is the kind of the built matter, mm -hmm. as a building format. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the only one. I think that it's one of the ones that basically distinguishes the practice as such in a way. No? Then how this thing has certain kind of like uh, power to unfold certain kind of arguments requires other mediums as well. So okay. it's not the only one. But I mean, but I'm saying that it's one of the things that distinguishes like, as a differentiation. Can I just read very yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, That's the point. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, Luis is doing what he's doing best. In, I mean, if we're now in Chicago, right? And um, we come from a cultural territory and a political territory where many people were trained as architects, as builders. Right? Um, yet, right now, with the entire economic crisis and the, the construction boom, one has to really understand what are the other spaces for construction. Right? Um, my question to you, and it's, it's a very easy one, um, there are builders who make buildings that I would argue is not architecture. Of course. So the condition by which you are identifying the specificity of what contributes ultimately the sole thing that the architects do, that means no, that you're, that, but, but, you are saying things that I'm not saying. So no, but like I'm trying I'm trying to open up, okay. right? Because mm -hmm. my interest here is that Architects, we make sociology as architects. We make politics as architects. We make art as architects. So <coughs> we can do multiple things, and this is the virtue and the defect, perhaps, of the architect as a figure, is that even when building, because one can build very bad, right? One can, <coughs> one can, one can write like an architect, right? And one can definitely speak from the space and the foundations, intellectually and, and, and structurally, like an architect. Not only about architecture. So it's not about writing about architecture or a, a painting about architecture, but it's painting architecture, it's drawing architecture, it's writing architecture, it's building architecture. And for me, this is a very important territory, because the moment in which we just simply reduce architecture to buildings, yeah. then we are elevating the status of buildings to architecture, yeah. which is very problematic. No, no, I, I, I agree with your concern. I just basically I think that you are making an interpretation no, make, nobody's making. I'm just, I mean, at least not me. I was saying that one of the specific... So is, is writing... Is writing no, it's not, actually, not, no, it's not architectural <laughs> practice, writing is writing. No, I mean, no, you can, no, 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 can you practice writing? You can write, of course. No, no. You can eat, you can cook. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't so. stop on account of me. There we go. No, please. I want to see who wins. <laughs> no, there is no winning. <laughs> so I also want to welcome uh, Sam Jacob. Uh, Sam Jacob is here joining us from the United Kingdom, uh, doing the British Pavilion. Uh, very lucky to have Sam here. Sam just recently established the Sam Jacob Studio. And uh, you know, has had a long history of writing and teaching, and you know, very good um, So we began by talking about, I guess, you know, the status of the National Pavilion, and maybe uh, to recap a little bit, we, we we began by talking about, you know, maybe the, the let's say the building as exhibition uh, or representation as exhibition, and you know, this led to a long discussion about specificity and, and, and you know, what what is architecture and what. Constitutes, you know, uh, and there was also a very uh, beautiful sermon given by Eva uh, about <laughs> the uh, architectural effects of Barcelona, Barcelona Pavilion and how it uh, killed the king. Uh, and 
You mean that one? Yeah, that was great. Yeah. It's on video. Watch later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Sam, could you uh, maybe maybe uh, just say something? Yeah, um, I know Jim Shea has this idea about the, the difference between architecture and representation, whether that's text, whether it's drawing, whether it's exhibition, mm. or whether it's building. And I think I'd always argue that there is not that they're the same thing, that architecture is always representation. You, mm. like, you look at um, San Marco, for example, just as goes both in here, which is very nice thing to say. It's, it's both a building, but it's also a building about being a building mm. and what the building can do. It's about the kind of power of rep architecture as representation. So I, I think you know the distinction between where architecture stops, where writing of architecture starts, where an exhibition <coughs> of architecture, you know, mm. how that fits all together, I'd say is really hazy. Like a lot of buildings and not about architecture. No. Um, and a lot of writing about architecture is not architecture. Mm. But I think writing it can be a propositional act and it can write things into existence. There's certainly architecture which wouldn't exist without having been imagined through words first of all. Mm. And so at the heart of all architecture I think is not um, <coughs> anything to do with the, with the truth. At the heart of all architecture is an idea of think of of talking something into existence, essentially telling a story. And the story can take very many different forms, I think. Mm. I mean, we're sitting amongst something now which is exhibition, mm. it's furniture, it's installation, it's architecture, it's something about architecture. It's all of those things simultaneously. And for me that's when the project of architecture is at its most powerful. It's not simply an act of constructing something. It's not about the act of constructing something. Why you might want to construct something. So I'm all for the, the fiction. <laughs> the fiction will make real sense. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I mean, ha have you been in the, in the central pavilion or not yet? Yeah. Um, what do you think? Pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we have to talk about it. Yeah. I, I, the, it's, I think it's a great show. I think it's a show about, about architecture. It's a show about architecture, which on the whole talks about architecture from a technical point of view, mm. which is incredible. And of course, embedded from the technical is not only the kind of building code, not only the kind of engineering uh, mm. um, calculations, but also the, the reason why we have those codes in the first place. Like the, the sort of, let's say, the, the way in which Society, culture, economics, um, health and safety, all of these mechanisms of, of, of the world, which are sort of abstract in many ways, become the world in which we live in. The way in which you know, a staircase is a staircase is not, not only something that you have to imagine, it's something which is prescribed in, in law. And I think that's fascinating the relationship between say, the legality of a staircase and the reality of a staircase. Mm. Um, so I, I think the, the sort of premise of the show is you can talk about architecture not from the perspective which we're all so used to, which is you know, theoretical, which is like uh, incredibly analytical mm. from a kind of intellectual point of view, but actually from the other perspective, and work backwards from building code to the reason why we have building codes in the, the first place. So that I think is a is a is a very different way of looking. At architecture, it's a very different sort of telescope onto the world of architecture. Mm -hmm. And I think quite shocking in some ways for a Biennale, the mm -hmm. kind of place where we're all used to being incredibly pretentious about architecture, mm -hmm. incredibly like, you know, uh, difficult to understand. Actually, it's a super accessible exhibition. Here's the load of toilets from mm -hmm. throughout the history of the world. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's anthropological, sociological, um, and it uses. I suppose the technicalities of architecture as a way of being to understand the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of concept mm -hmm. of architecture. So in that sense, I think it's a really refreshing way to think about mm. how you can host a big audience talks to the kind of core of what architecture is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I mean, I'm still like... I mean, I'm very slow, so I mean, I just stop by. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by the quantities and the and the, no. I think that uh, on one hand, I agree with you completely. I mean, that is super refreshing to discuss that in the context of a Biennale. On the other hand, I'm trying trying to still distill the difference 
um, between that and a kind of a professional fair or in the sort of like construct or others. Like, I mean, history <laughs> may, plays a key role into that. Um, my, I still like in the back question I have will be where is the kind of relational part of architecture in a way when you isolate or encapsulate the parts of architecture as kind of like a like an addition of parts in a way. So I don't know if at the core of architecture is the parts or is the relation between them. And I think that show highlights very much the parts in a way, no? And, um, and the relation is something that we build on top of those parts, but the show doesn't highlight those. No? I mean, the, it's not like a system to system relationship, <laughs> it's like almost like a isolated, encapsulating part, no? And I, that's my kind of like, I mean, question, concern about the approach. But I mean, I'm still, it's too close I mean, to some time because it's overwhelming the quantity of information. Yeah. And also, like, I, I mean, I don't have time to go through all the kind of the more analytical or synthetic documents that are maybe highlighting those kind of references in a way. But I mean, as a show, because of the fact of highlighting so much the kind of the isolated parts, I mean, I don't know if at the core of architecture are those parts or are the relation between those, you know. Yeah, there was, have you ever heard this language ship talking about the toilet? I know. No, no, no. No? It's so. It's again, it's, it's a very, very nice reading of, um, it's almost like a joke, right? But they say, jokes usually have an end, but this one doesn't. Um, and so he says, if you want to know how, and that's what he talks about architecture, he says, I don't know anything about architecture, but the only thing I know is that if you go into a, a French toilet, you find a black hole, right? That is this idea of the, uh, subconscious and it's tormented and that you put it and then it disappears and then it's gone, right? If you go into the into the German one, it has this section in which uh, you first and you put your excrement and you look it and you analyze it and you hermeneutically look if you are going to sick, if you are going to die, no, perhaps, who knows, maybe, right? Then you go into the, into the British, right? And, uh, and you go and you just flash it with the water, right? And it's just like, it's, it's like it's, it's kind of exuberant into the entire... And, and, and he makes a really of the conscious behind it through a space of subconscious reading that is represented through the architectural spaces. So I still haven't seen, right? I still haven't gone. But I assume that by comparison, one can, can start understanding the bodies that are attached to each one of those pieces um, and, and how those codes. So, I mean, talking about codes, um, within the, the US, we, we have really. Um, tried to compile through the evidence of buildings, right? Mm -hmm. What codes in a global scale allowed for certain things to emerge and to happen. So in that case, we start from the totality to sometimes end up into the specificity mm -hmm. of that. And what codes actually were transferred from one culture to the other and adopted. Mm -hmm. And that in a certain way is the space of, of exchange and of flattening of, of that landscape. But um, one of the things that we are very much engaged right now it is in the production of, um, of the fundamental aspects that constitute the architectural office, mm -hmm. right? How does one produce architecture? Mm -hmm. And what are the elements that one should bring to the conversation for, to fundamentally actually mm -hmm. make architecture and not just building? Mm -hmm. um, and in that process, we have been researching office manuals. Mm -hmm. Manuals that are ultimately the evidence <laughs> that allow you to articulate the relationships between bodies once it's more than the ones that can sit around the table. And in that rewriting, actually, of that manual, of those protocols, of those codes, um, one can do that as an actualization, just bringing it into the present time, or can do it as an architectural project, recasting the relationships, constructing new spaces of collective action, mm -hmm. um, really, and ultimately, for me, I always have a huge problem sometimes when I think I'm not sure that a home necessarily is architecture. No? Mm -hmm. and, and that's if, if we were to split the discipline of architecture in many disciplines, there would be the, the homies, right? There would be the homemakers. Then there is the architect as a civic figure, the one that articulates the body of politics, the political body of a, of a civic society. And, um, and so, going into, into all those different aspects, I have no idea how all those small parts, that I, what for me sounds like, is that those small parts actually are able to talk about the larger parts of the collective civic space. Um, and, and so when you talk about the relationship of the parts, um, 
you are still making a claim for much more disciplinary understanding of how the composition of architectural elements come together, or what, no. is, what is that force that brings no, them I, together? Uh, yeah, I would say that, I mean, like, that if, if there is no kind of relation between the systems, it becomes like an industrial fair. So you would have to make that kind of relationship. It could be through kind of, yeah, I think that this is kind of a very much a historical kind of reading that is making in capture and so it's like a temporal one. No? I mean, it could be like a contemporary one and then make the cross-section like that and, and talk about other relationships. But if the relationship is not at the core of architectural practice, then, I mean, I have questions about what is the core in a way. I mean, I think that by encapsulating them, I mean, I think that makes no sense. But I mean, I don't see that this is what is happening in that pavilion. You know, it was something I was shocked. I said, okay, well, what will be the relationship with those is such an amount of elements that are isolated on purpose that basically, I mean, we have to make the assumption that we have to make the projection of what is the relationship between them in a way, and we can have many. Maybe there's a critique of thinking of the current the conditions under which we produce architecture, sure. many of that, like all stuff. <laughs> and maybe this is where maybe your project comes in, is that we think about the building process now is so different to even what it was 20 years ago. It's incredibly Yeah. Not just the building code, but in terms of professional practice, in terms of like uh, uh, the, the procurement of work, like, in, in every stage it's become incredibly systematized. So it, it actually has fragmented. I mean, it's very difficult for anybody to have an overview of anything. So um, there's perhaps a critique of that in better than should, but I think like, when you're doing the, the, the projects in the US pavilion is actually is trying to kind of get into that at the same time as breaking it apart, which I think is a really significant thing. So I think if you don't formulate it's like an idea of practice, that we just fall into what's necessary in order to mm. win a contract, in order to build something, in order to mm. have a project in a magazine, in order to win your award, or whatever it is that you want to achieve, then you, you all you're doing is replicating you know, what, what, mm. what you're what the system wants you to do. So only by understanding or misunderstanding perhaps like the system, mm. the way in which it's really compartmentalized, the fact that it's so specialist that you have somebody who deals with the facade, sure. somebody who deals with the story, somebody who deals with separation, somebody who deals with you know, fire, somebody who deals with like the way in which buildings that the system that we see is entirely mm. different. Maybe you know, not necessarily better, I would mm. say, but like so maybe there is something in the, the elements of architecture, which is both a kind of, uh, as a retreading the, 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 the way in which those very basic books of architecture, mm. features about architecture, mm. and walls, and mm. but also the way in which the specialization within mm. architecture and construction industry. So maybe there's a way of, so we look at the corridor in the show, mm. and this incredible story about this aristocrat who builds You know, why is why is the corridor because he never wants to be seen by his servants for whatever reason, and no reason. It's incredible specialist, you know, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Insane idea that you could live your whole life on the corridor. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's that kind of the fact that corridor could be the whole world and so specific mm -hmm. is I think there's something suggestive in that is that we have to occupy those kinds of those kinds of compartments. And invest them with some incredible new sort of meaning. Otherwise, they're just empty roles which we will fulfill until we retire or die. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> happens to us. Yeah. Happens to us. Yeah. yeah. There is something interesting about. Um, do we really have to use microphones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There is something very interesting about that. Um, because if we are to see what happened with the architectural profession, right, in which schools and society itself try to atomize expertise, right? Another very dangerous one. Suddenly one becomes a facade specialist, then someone becomes one of those elements specialists. This is, has been something extremely recent, where then the figure of the project manager that is a very contemporary condition needs to appear, right? As if the architect was unable to manage its architecture, its financial, its political, its Uh, consequences, right? I think this has been one of the biggest losses that architects, in the claim of uh, certain disciplinary specificity, have lost really the role of negotiating 
their role in with society. So the fact that uh, we go back into the elements, into those fundamental aspects that somehow could divide the specializations that we have, I don't think it is to atomize it even further, but to realize how those things begin to participate actively into the whole, right? And uh, and I think this is this is the really difficult problem of articulating a question today in a place in which that Tylerism, that the space of uh, atomization, what produces is workers into a larger system that is already planned and articulated by other forces, political, um, economical, right? Uh, uh, economic in, in that regard. So I think that's, that's a great point. Uh, something that's also in the air that I guess you have to the the theory of view, right? um, when Sam, you were speaking, is the word standard was on my mind. Uh, you know, just the word, the, the construction of standard somehow, you know, and also the rebellion to standards or the mistakes to standard, which I think all of which are extremely productive when, when, you, when you can, I mean, when, why standards are, I think, important and productive in some ways, you know, without normal, how does one become misbehaved? A person, uh, because you know, there's the establishment of a collective awareness of well-being, um, and also, which is why I think you know, a thousand is a, a very interesting number. Is that large enough number now for us to establish a standard, or maybe not, not necessarily a standard, but definitely a pattern, uh, some some kind of a pattern of behaviors. And so, once we are we are able to understand normal normalized states uh, of certain types of. Uh, tropes of, of behaviors because you know human tendencies are actually rather limited. We we only behave in very small number of ways, even if it's a thousand. And I also like you know, stuff. I mean that's something that's what was in the air that I was thinking about. And, uh, and another thing that I was thinking about was the relationship between fairs and this. Mm-hmm. Right? The Biennale is not so much a fair. Uh, whereas I guess you know uh, the world fair is actually called that, and also other uh, trade fairs, if you call that, or expo, like mm-hmm. that is an entirely different animal from mm-hmm. what this is. And the idea of the National Pavilion and expos are truly architecture, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, the pavilions, buildings. Uh, the, I mean, off of these two thoughts, I wonder if we uh, somehow continue the conversation if, if we're still okay. I guess since I'm the moderator, yeah, let's keep them. <laughs> it's a question of relevance, yeah. right? The difference between a fair and, and, and a biennale, mm-hmm. or what this is. And just to give you an example, in uh, one of the projects inside of this 1958, um, <laughs> Brussels World Fair Exhibition, yes. Yes. U.S. pavilion, um, incredible building, a smaller pavilion, is a, a collateral project by uh, a, a Boston-based group that is called the American Idealist Group. These guys, they were tasked to represent the U.S. and, and, and to have something that would reflect the social and political questions uh, of their time. They decided to make an incredible building of faceted triangulated, you would love it, uh, and, <laughs> Uh, geometries and inside it is uh, a linear photographic exhibition uh, that is plastered into the walls, constructing a kind of all engulfing tunnel um, of um, articles and uh, images of um, racial problems in the US. I mean, the way they frame it, they say they were going to address not social and economical and race and gender issues, but the Negro problem, right? And um, they said, if we do not address the Negro problem, that would backfire us in this moment in time. That exhibition um, was running for two weeks. The New York Times made an article, and a governor from the South um, said, we should not go outside of our country to clean or dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. What they were expecting is that international voices would see what was happening, and the US would try to do something. Well, four years after the, the, uh, civil, uh, uh, the, the Bill of Civil uh, Rights was passed, right? But the fact that that exhibition was closed by the government because they considered that that was not appropriate, I was wondering, we were wondering as curators, what would we do 
that we would get the exhibition closed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not through other mediums, but just even really understanding what are the questions, where does architecture become relevant mm -hmm. in articulating some of the situations. And architecture is intrinsically political. And this is, I'm not saying that this was an architectural project, this was an exhibition project, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But there are conditions by which architecture becomes a real instrument of denunciation. And we could talk about energy, right, and sustainability, and lead creating systems, and how we can move from quantifiable, verifiable boxes to architecture that really address some of those questions. Or we could look into what does other means of like consumption of media and data, and, and really try to understand how we have constructed that space to architecture and so on. So um, there is something in there that for me is, is it's interesting how this exhibition was closed. And I don't think anyone in this pavilion has anything dangerous enough. <laughs> in this way, no one has anything dangerous enough to be closed. Maybe we do have, but there are a thousand projects. So, <laughs> like that. so you will have to find them. And I think this is a serious question, because that what, what that means is that no one is looking at us. No one cares about us. Only us. So this is almost, I always say that sometimes we look like the Alcoholics Anonymous Club. Right? <laughs> Where we talk about our problems and our pleasures and our ideas. But why don't we have the entire government coming? We send letters to the President of the United States. We send letters to all the Secretaries of the State, in, to all the representatives in the US government. We receive one response back. The one of energy, actually. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Who said, incredible project, we love to and this is interesting that the country that has one of the, we could say, largest economic and political power in the world doesn't consider architecture relevant. We have the smallest budget in the entire Biennale, probably, of any national pavilion, because they don't consider architecture relevant, right? And so I think this is a problem that no one takes us seriously, except ourselves, that we take ourselves so seriously, right? Well, I think at the in the um, the art um, obviously just closed close before the art session, right? Um, <coughs> in the British Pavilion, which are, and art, I think suffers from exactly the same kind of situation as as art actually, no one takes any notice of it. But and it's also I think what you do in the Pavilion in the British one, the artist Jeremy Deller made a, a banner. Yeah. You put a show about uh, socialism. The rough and, um, uh, and mm. radical <coughs> arts across history. And one of the exhibits is this band which says Prince Harry Kills Me. <laughs> and it's obviously a reference to Prince Harry's famous sense of humour. You know, he likes to dress up like a Nazi and <laughs> have a great laugh. Hey, who will make it in Las Vegas? <laughs> and, um, but he also was interviewed on his tour in, uh, with the army in Iraq and was interviewed about killing the Taliban. So it was a sort of play on mm. words and the British government said you have to take this, you have to take this out. And they, they argued that it was because it was provocative, mm. that it would mm. endanger British troops mm. still in Afghanistan. And, um, uh, I think in a show like that <coughs> actually really direct, super direct about these kind gigantic cultural institutions mm. of Britain. And maybe it takes that to be sensitive. Maybe it's the fact that we don't quite confront things mm. quite enough. We, we, we need to maybe be more controversial. Mm. <laughs> maybe we need to come to talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to talk more directly to those institutions that we, we, we want to engage in. Maybe it's not that bad, maybe it's about shouting. <laughs> no, but, uh, maybe it's also uh, what one of the parents said to in the uh, U.S. Pavilion this year: the children horses, right? If we're, if, I guess you know, if we're in a state of some kind of for or against, uh, there's you know, side ideological territories, and if we're trying to shout in order to get in one's way, uh, I don't know. I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, there's the uh, if, if you have a will to change the system in some ways, you can always, always need allies and alliances in some ways. You can never do anything alone. Uh, not only that, 
when you get into this, this kind of situation, you know, you either have to deploy a kind of soft diplomacy uh, where you, you're insistent about what you want, but you know, you're not exactly pissing anybody off. Uh, or, I guess, there's the training horses. In any case, it, it takes a close circle of trusted allies in order for these plots to be done, I guess. And, and so, I, I don't know. Like, in a way, I see this, I see the finale as some kind of you know, academy of awards where it, it is actually the designers trying to plot, but uh, if we aren't careful with uh, the, the message, I guess, you know, it's, it would just be foiled in some ways. I think that the experience think, of, of the national pavilions, of course, when you visit the Germany and you, you walk into each show and you know this is a beautiful show, this is an interesting show, this is a terrible show, this is a boring show, whatever you may think of it. Like the the experience that, that that's going on behind the scenes in each of us, I think is so fascinating. Mm. When we talk to the curators from different countries, even the way in which it's Organize that. Who commissions it? Mm. Where is the money from? Mm. Do they have to raise money? Who organizes what? Um, and the way in which they then kind of interrogate about their proposal. Like, does whoever is that's commissioning care? Do they care too much? And the stories which, which you hear from, I've had stories from the Germans, which are amazing. Mm. I've had stories from the Iranians, which are fascinating. And everybody has this kind of Story of the experience of basically dealing with their own nation, and in some ways, so so for that to be revealed, I think would be would be an incredible series of <laughs> national pavilions <laughs> exposing the, uh, the mechanisms of each, of each nation. Um, I, I think we're, I guess, at a point where uh, where maybe we can, uh, you know, in, invite. I mean, kind of, this is a really funny situation. We're in a dollhouse, you guys are dolls. <laughs> and, and now we're being we're inside of the vitrine. Can we, ex, can we invite the other side of the vitrine uh, to break the fourth wall? Uh, Matt, you look like you have a question. <laughs> Get you get your opinions on maybe comparing or contrasting or something uh, the strategy of elements, which at my at my limited knowledge of it so far is that they are taking elements like physical elements and putting them in, a, in an exhibition hall, and whereas this is sort of like dreaming up these scenarios to address a different type of element, and I wonder if you could sort of like think. Think about those two side by side, and what the curatorial implications and the strategy of them. Uh, Matt, do, do you mind specifying specify a little when you say element? Fundamental. Oh, okay. In, in, the, in the main exhibition, in the main exhibition, um, they sort of like took these parts, like maybe a, a facade panel or a balcony. Uh, that exists as, as a thing and, and displayed it. Um, and then, and like Sam said, they're, they're, they're embedded with their own uh, polit political, social stories and history. And then, but this takes a much different approach of just sort of dreaming of these, these little worlds. Um, and I wonder, um, yeah, to that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, I yes. yeah. maybe I can answer for you. Oh, for me. <laughs> uh, there, is, there is something in uh, opening up what the fundamentals are, right? So, um, and I would say that dreaming in that case, or uh, fictionalizing, um, or, um, it is a fundamental aspect of architectural practice too, right? So the whole question here is how much each one of the pavilions has really managed. I mean, there were different questions. The national pavilions were asked to respond to the how uh, modernity had been absorbed, right, um, uh, in each national context and how um, uh, that had impacted uh, in some way the national identity. 
uh, and the architectural uh, practice in, in that regard. And the second question is the one that Ryan is uh, answering himself uh, or trying to open up is the one of fundamentals. Um, and I believe that each national pavilion answered uh, differently in a different intensity to perhaps both questions, right? Not only one, but both. Um, and, and there are things that uh, that we might argue, or some people might argue, that are less uh, specific to architecture as a, as a, as a discipline, uh, yet they are still fundamental aspects of architectural practice. And I think this is when one goes to write a curriculum. Right? One of the exhibitions is about uh, uh, radical pedagogies. Right? How does it, how does one to teach an architect to become an architect, or how does one teach someone to become a builder, or how does one teach someone to become an engineer, right? And I think those are the distinctions in which definitely narration or in fiction are part, essential, fundamental parts of architectural practice, right? And so um, that is something that um, I think we need to keep on, on repeating. Uh, even when the fear or the vertical that if we open up too much the field, then we are left with not knowing exactly what to do, right? And so this, I think this is why it's so interesting to figure out what are the pedagogical structures of the schools and how they have shifted over the years and what has become more important or less. And to even see the number of the students that they sign up for uh, uh, legal practices or that they sign up for business models or that sign up for uh, uh, aesthetics or composition. In the School of Barcelona, I just learned that we are not going to have any more aesthetics. That was a fundamental class in which we had philosophers coming to teach us. It was mandatory, aesthetics one and aesthetics two. It was mandatory to have a philosopher in your education to simply blow your mind <laughs> as you had it. Right. And that that is not anymore a fundamental block of education of an architect to me is so problematic, right? And so um, one of the things that and I talked that with him at some point and uh, still from we want to start uh, an accreditation system, right? Because talking about codes and fundamental aspects of architectural practice in the US is that the schools of architecture need to be accredited by a professional body called the AIA. Right? So well, I don't believe that people should be given um, a little certified uh, a logo if they want or a certain uh, ability to practice uh, the critical thinking of architectural uh, 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 practice uh, and yet there is nobody that regulates that. No one regulates that you are good enough to actually be an architect, to practice and to be practical, to innovate enough, right? They will make sure that the buildings that you build don't, do not collapse, that have certain... Right? So what are the limits of measurable what constitutes an architect, I think they are really still a bit precarious, right? There is not enough dreaming, there is not one checkbox in accreditation. It's like, are you visionary enough? Is this school visionary enough? Right? And I think that to me is, uh, is one of the fundamental or necessary elements of architecture, for sure. I, did I answer well for you? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> But, but maybe also uh, to, to continue on the thought of uh, dream or storytelling or fiction making, um, you know, the, 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 thing, the, thing, the thing about making stories is that, you know, what is all true and what is, project, what, what is being projected kind of makes the next chapter, and I, I, you know, I mean, that's why we dream, that's why we make up stupid things. And in fact, I would much prefer stupid things than smart things. Are you doing that? Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he does. But I think that, you know, like, the, the dream is, is much more, much more than something stupid. Mm. And I think we're, we're sitting in something right now, which is, you know, I think a lot of people will say, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so fictional, it's so, like, of course it is, but, like, as we know, as Freud tells us, dreams have a meaning. However playful it might be, it's also talking about something because architecture is not only a technical thing, not only a professional thing, it's also a cultural mm. thing. It is already the embodiment of dreams, of the imagination. Mm. And here we are sitting in a kind of archetypal 
generic kind of thing that we imagine heaven mm-hmm. to yeah. be. Yeah. You know, ghost of a house. Mm-hmm. Ghost of the fountain table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're sitting on a big chair. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're like the kind of king slash father thing. You don't. That's it, it's you want. I wanted to sit there, but yeah. there was a gap. She's like in the gold box and the three guys. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's a sort of, there's a, obviously there's a little fantasy to it, but the fantasy is not whimsy. Mm-hmm. And I think there's, especially not such a, if you start to do anything which involves this kind of fantasy world, and I'd say what you're doing in the show is actually a kind of critique, in a sense. It's about another kind of fundamental form of architecture, which is not the kind of fundamentals that's being dealt with mm-hmm. in the US Pavilion or in the Central Pavilion, mm-hmm. but another kind of sort of narrative mm-hmm. fundamentalism, mm-hmm. symbolic fundamentalism. And that is, uh, um, though it's all maybe fun, mm-hmm. it's deadly serious, mm-hmm. you know, it's all fun, but they talk about the relationship of mm-hmm. identity and power to mm-hmm. space and how you know, the most basic forms of arrangement a table and some chairs actually embody power relationships. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, of course, that's fundamental. But that's exactly mm-hmm. what architecture does. So I think, you know, sitting amongst your installation, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a mistake to think of it as, a, as something which is simply from minds and EQ. I think it's also super serious and a mm-hmm. critique of the way in which architecture mm-hmm. embodies and kind of controls this. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that basically the, the, I mean, the problem is we will agree on that. I mean, basically, the, the, the understanding of architecture as a kind of a cultural practice requires a certain level of um, narrative. I mean, I, I'm not so fan of the fun as a kind of, a, kind of an engine for architecture. I'm more attached to play, which I think that has some kind of level of technique attached to it that I think that, that uh, helps to... Because to, fun doesn't. No, fun is more like the, the effect of play most of the time, but it doesn't have to have technique relationships. I mean, it has a certain specific difference in a way in the two. And I think that uh, one of the <coughs> things that basically I will say that we could read in every pavilion is the game that has been set up uh, in terms of building this kind of correlation between formal and uh, cultural kind of unfoldings of architecture, and then how do we understand the second of a critique, uh, some sort of like excitement about certain things, certain level of uh, encouragement of others, and so on. Uh, so I think that the kind of the cultural nature of architecture is embedded in every project that we see. And but I mean, I, I'm just trying to basically give a little bit slightly different approach than not the role of the dream or the fan, and to be much more playful and cultural uh, as a way of like again bringing the kind of the cultural specificity of architecture and its territory of deployment in a way. Uh, does anyone have any other thoughts? Larry, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, thank you. First of all, it's very complicated. Um, I'm wondering, you know, to speak to your point here, though, about architecture's ability to speak in any position. Because I, I get excited when I say that. But I think also maybe one of the reasons is, is that the architecture perhaps is fundamentally conservative in a way uh, that it, 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 it makes these changes that you're talking about in this narrative play, for instance, in this show, uh, in a very subtle way mm-hmm. uh, that, it, that it typically perhaps is a sort of right? mm-hmm. investment in people's lives or an individual family or you know, national. Uh, if indeed it doesn't change and or speak to things in, in, in a very kind of subtle way. And so, you know, while we probably all want to get involved in both of our schools and dive into these social issues, I, I find it very hard, or it makes architecture not so doable when you see that happen a lot. I love to say that. It's my observation. Um, but I think why that happens is, is an important question. And I also think that. We also need to accept the solidness of architecture as well. And that's the thing I really like about this show. That it starts speaking about the domestic realm. Mm-hmm. Um, I could be able to speak about this with Robert Adams and Evans and, and, uh, and Evans, Robert Adams, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the 
this to me talks about this kind of slow transformation mm -hmm. in society and how that begins to uh, make evidence of itself in subtle ways to think about it. No, no, I, I think, I, I mean, I will, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I mean, the, the kind of, but also, I, I mean, just maybe to follow up a little bit in a slightly different, I like the kind of the collective, collective nature of the practice in a way, requires a kind of mediation that is very different than not the artist practice where it's a kind of a subjective, immediate kind of, so the kind of the subtlety that includes the kind of the mediation of the collective to be able to build any piece <laughs> of architecture immediately puts it into a certain kind of level of tone that is very different than maybe like an artistic statement that could be much more straightforward, shouting kind of like... Um, I, I mean, it, it, I, I think that the, the fact that architectural practice is always collective and requires a lot of effort, in a way, from every part. It's not like a, the only projection of the subjectivity of the architect just doing something and just building it by itself. It immediately puts the architectural kind of territory into a sub subtile kind of like... Um, different kind of like pixel level, a different resolution, the way that it makes it, the statements that it makes, in a way. That basically make it very polemic is very difficult because it's highly conservative because it involves a lot of um, negotiation, <laughs> and a lot of compensation, and a lot of like uh, collectivity. And that, that immediately brings its radicality to the representational mode, or when it gets built, immediately becomes more quiet or a different tone. Let me, let me, there is one thing that... Um, you make me think of the as I do agree, subtlety is always I always say um doesn't really use underwear before, but um, underwear is more sexy than nakedness, right? Um, and it has it is something about the, the not telling the things just straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yet um, sometimes we, and this is something that I have to confront many times, how do we make people who are not experts in reading the subtleties mm -hmm. understand and, and, and participate in the construction of relevance and the, the learning of that. Meaning, the society who are not trained architects, mm -hmm. if we are not able to speak and communicate about those values that we see emanating from the work, and um, we treat them just as pure aesthetic objects, um, we might not be able to use the force of society to help us push certain architectures that have a certain value. And I think this is what has happened, is that um, uh, many cities around the world, they, uh, in order to think that they were entering progress, that they were actually part of the globalized world, they started desiring certain types of buildings, but the image of buildings, right? So one of the things that we have in, in the U.S. pavilion of these 25 that are addressing issues, one of them is called cargo cult, right? Cargo cult was this idea that you would have the <coughs> image of something, but, but not the essence of it. Not the advancement, really, technological, social, political, economical, that was embedded within that architecture, but you would have the image of it. Why? Because people were consuming architecture. They were not demanding architecture. They were consuming an image of it. So, the subtle, we all like more subtle things than explicit things. My question is, how do we become not necessarily explicit, but are able to communicate? Not necessarily. There was this incredible conversation that you were the editor of Quaderns at the time between Sylvia Levin, Alejandro Zayera, and Jeff Kibbins, that probably is the text that I have recommended the most to any of my students ever, and that had to do with metaphor and had to do with. Uh, how does an architect communicate with, with, uh, with society? And Alejandro was arguing that metaphors was a good way for him to establish that space of communication. Yet the problem is that when metaphor becomes uh, uh, the object in and of itself, or it becomes a medium of conduit, Sylvia Lenin was saying, you know, we don't need to communicate, take your people with cocktails and just make architecture speak. And then Jeff Kidney was like, architecture should not communicate, it should produce this space of mysticism and total illegibility in which you are taken architecture speaks and performs. Yes, but if we are to take the forces of society with us, uh -huh. I find the text and the footnotes extremely important, mm -hmm. and the stories and the narratives extremely important mm -hmm. in making that subtlety more subtle. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where uh, in a, I always, if we think of my own trajectory, I always like to be extremely cryptic and I, the 
first exhibition I ever did was Architecture as Doubt, right? And uh, Architecture of Doubt. And, um, and every time more is how do we explain that doubt? How do we explain that question? How do we explain and communicate that disruption? And so I like when architecture is able to do it, but I also like when words are able to do it. Serious. <laughs> 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 
Can you do the same for the US to be like, please, come? And, uh, yes. Uh, the US Pavilion has become not office US, as many people think, but it's office us. Yeah. Is um, is, a, is the construction of our new architectural office that is going to work globally, it's 100 people. It's probably the first office that starts not only one, two, and three, but understanding this space of collectivity, um, where six of them, the partners, are going to be working in the headquarters that are here in Venice, the first headquarters of office us are in Venice. And, and this office is taking history and the project of modernity and, and the architecture uh, uh, discipline as its uh, first client, and um, over the six months of the Biennale is going to take uh, 25 issues that we think are important to address. Um, and for that exercise of addressing these 25 clients, um, uh, we have constructed an archive of uh, architecture uh, <coughs> produced within a global context. Um, and that happens to be, uh, just to take an example for uh, closure, it has been the US, has been the country that has been more, more buildings in more countries than anyone over the last 100 years. So we are having, we have a library that is going to help these people to really try to understand what has constructed architecture as a global practice from 1914 to today, and 200 offices that we are examining closely. And that kind of expertise is, uh, uh, at the same time, providing open exhibition, so you can go and look into projects that were probably made in Taiwan. So tomorrow we are going to have a series of diplomatic openings, and as well in the UK and so on. And at the same time, try to understand what politics, what social conditions, what construction materials, what uh, specificities of that particular site uh, were uh, responding back to an expertise that was US-based, but at this point, in a certain way, it represents that idea of globalization. So we are trying to learn lessons about how to become better global architects with uh, collective desires, but local understandings. And um, if anyone wants to join the US, um, you can. <laughs> so it's almost an obvious, but it's actually movement if you want. Um, I mean, the, the Spanish Pavilion is, is a collective work of like uh, lots of people. So I mean, basically, what we decided is to focus on the interior as, as a, 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 it has like a double role. One would be the resistance to kind of certain kind of a narrative that detaches, I mean, basically interior from the qualities and just focus on envelope, uh, but also as a way of like, also like identifying one of the main kind of specificities of the kind of more of the Mediterranean area architecture that basically has been crossing different kind of historical moments. So basically that kind of interiority and the qualification of interiors as a way of like crossing kind of like different historical moments and how this thing has been basically de further developed through time. So basically that helps us to bridge between pre-modern, modern and contemporary architecture. And the way that we did it was basically like collecting 100 cases of uh, interiors only, so we only show interiors, we don't show any kind of exterior image of the building, and we highlight 12 contemporary buildings, um, one of the ones are, I mean, Churti Chagas, um, great proposal for Matadero, but basically uh, that kind of like contemporary building is also like shown with 10 historical kind of references. So basically we did that research and then we did like a post kind of analysis of trying to and unveil or unfold almost taxonomies or like genealogies uh, that has to do with, with certain kind of qualities or effects that those kind of things have been created from different perspectives, more psychological, more kind of environmental as well. And then the exhibition layout basically is, is doing uh, 12 interiors within an interior. The Spanish pavilion is, if you look at it, it's basically like an interior in itself, it's a box that has no um, exteriority. So we Develop like 12 interiors with super large pictures that basically fall within themselves and produce some more like an immersive environment where everybody is displayed. The photographer who did the picture, I mean, gets the photography completely like destroyed because it's false. <laughs> the architect that is shown does not get the full uh, uh, building shown, it's only partially shown through a section of an image. And the visitor gets kind of a, a displacement within the kind of the conventional scale because everything is out of scale. The benches are too small, the pictures are too large, the sections are too large. So this kind of like everybody gets out of the zone of comfort in order to provoke this kind of like 
cultural conversation about what is architecture. And the last kind of characteristics that I was mentioned before is that we try to basically highlight the possibility of doing architectural theory, narrative fiction, whatever we want to call it, through built matter, in a way, as a way of like, so highlighting one of the specificities of the country. So, and uh, this is just uh, uh, There are two primary aspects to our efforts. There's the, this is uh, this, this part, the, the physical part that, that you're uh, experiencing. And there's the video documentary, uh, which is behind Sam. And actually, all, of, all three of you are in. Uh, we're, uh, in this video, we're talking about the uh, imports and exports of ideologies, uh, you know, the making or the makeups of a cosmopolitan society. And, uh, but then on this part of the room, what you're looking at, I think I really appreciate the sound reading. In fact, it's incredibly serious. I mean, also, Larry's mention of Robert Robin of course, we were reading it while we were designing it. And uh, it's super great uh, to have you know, the, the Easter eggs from the fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, no, but what we, what we were doing was looking at uh, domesticity as, uh, let's say, the partial whole relationship of domestic unit as one possible origin of architecture and uh, deciphering uh, the, the contemporary uh, move where we have a standardization of the real estate industry where we expect the parts. We expect a two-bedroom home. Uh, so if once upon a time we would, would say the caveman never set out looking for a two-bedroom cave, uh, today we would look for these things. But at the same time, you know, uh, to take that step further, and Sam is absolutely right, in some ways it's some kind of critique of the very, very subtle way of thinking. If we were to consolidate the programs into single program houses, for example, we're sitting in the house of social dining, which uh, the dynamic of the politics was definitely something we're thinking about too. And then also the House of Sleep, House of Alchemy, <coughs> House of Shit, for example. Um, we're also thinking about functions, the cycle of functions. If you take a crack, it's because you biologically need to. But then there's also the, the House of Shit is also the fortress of solitude, uh, where if, uh, when you are so intimate with anyone, you need to take a break and, and you know, delve into other realities that you know are windowed by the book or whatever else. So uh, really, really appreciate uh, our panels. Thank you so much. I, I don't want you to stop. I think you should explain the project for me. Uh, no, I, I need to run, but uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Emma Frank has left the house. <laughs> And uh, Sam and Luis Ortega. And uh, tonight at 6.30, we have a cocktail party uh, here in this quarter. Should it rain, we will convene here. But then, in any case, bring your friends, come back, and uh, we'll enjoy a drink or two uh, in the courtyard. Also, come back here and visit. With apologies to uh, Hans Ulrich Obris from Swiss Pavilion, who wanted to be here but couldn't, uh, I guess we'll, we'll uh, make this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.